Okay, Chapter 9C, World War I. Quote, the government of the Western nations, whether monarchical or republican, had passed into the invisible hands of a plutocracy, international in power and grasp. It was, I venture to suggest, this semi-occult power which pushed the mass of the American people into the cauldron of World War I. Unquote. British military historian Major General J. F. C. Fuller, 1941. World War I was planned and fought with the main goal of uniting all nations under a single world authority in the bloody aftermath, and the secondary goal of making money off the loans needed to finance the war, further putting the Western nations on the hook to the Illuminati bankers. Remember now, throughout history, wars are always started at the top level of the ruling class, which today is the Illuminati and their puppets. This includes financial oligarchs, major politicians, presidents, major advisors, and wealthy businessmen. Wars are always fought by the middle class and lower class, which are forced into service by the governments the Illuminati control. According to the Great Plan Sterilized History Books, World War I was started as the result of the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, on June 28, 1914. The assassination of Franz Ferdinand was what is called a false flag event, whereby a pre-planned situation occurs in order to trigger another situation that was wanted before the first even took place. Norman Dodd, former director and chief investigator of the Committee to Investigate Tax-Exempt Foundations of the U.S. House of Representatives, the Reese Commission, we already went over, testified that the committee had studied the minutes of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace as part of the Reese Commission's investigation. The committee stated, quote, the trustees of the foundation brought up a single question. If it is desirable to alter the life of an entire people, is there any means more efficient than war? They discussed this question for a year and came up with an answer. There are no known means more efficient than war, assuming the objective is altering the life of an entire people. That leads them to a question. How do we involve the United States in a war? Unquote. Remember, this idea of taking the U.S. to war is coming from a tax-free foundation, supposedly committed to peace, the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Betterment of Mankind. This quote was from 1909, five years before the official beginning of World War I. It was around the time of this statement in the early 1900s that Illuminati bankers financed and promoted an arms race in Britain, France, Russia, Germany, and America in preparation for the coming World War. The murder of Franz Ferdinand was enough to excuse the start of war in Europe, and it was quickly escalated by Illuminati minions but the United States had largely followed a policy of non-intervention, and the citizens of the United States wanted nothing to do with the events unfolding in Europe. In fact, President Woodrow Wilson, the one who signed the Federal Reserve Act into law, had as his campaign motto for his re-election in 1916, quote, he kept us out of the war, unquote, when in fact his Illuminati puppet masters and handlers desperately wanted to entangle the United States in the pre-planned war. Enter yet another false flag event. The false flag attack is based upon the Hegelian dialectic, which again consists of problem-reaction-solution. The entities running the government, the Illuminati, present the problem in the form of a terror attack against that government's own citizens. The reaction then comes from the terrified public demanding governmental action. The solution to the initial problem, which they created to start with, is presented to the unknowing masses as the best and only response to the initial problem, 
further placing them under governmental Illuminati Great Plan New World Order control. False flag operations are designed to deceive the public in such a way that the operations appear as if they are being carried out by other entities. The name is derived from the military concept of flying false colors, that is, flying the flag of the enemy combatants. The term comes from the old days of wooden ships, when one ship would hang the flag of its enemy in order to get close enough to execute an all-out ambush with cannon fire. Because the enemy's flag was hung instead of the flag of the real country of the attacking ship, it was called a false flag attack. Citizens of the United States were successfully fooled by a false flag to enter the war in 1917 by a series of diabolical efforts, culminating in the sinking of an enormous passenger ship named the Lusitania. President Woodrow Wilson was directly involved in the deceptions and formally sanctioned the United States participation in the war in a secret agreement with England on March 9, 1916. We know about this agreement because it was leaked and confirmed by Sir Edward Gray, Ambassador Walter Hines Page, C. Hartley Grattan, and Colonel Edward Mandel House. In the documented conversation between alleged 33rd degree Freemason Colonel House President Wilson's Rothschild appointed advisor and Sir Edward Gray, the Foreign Secretary of England regarding how to get America into the war, Gray inquired, quote, What will Americans do if Germans sink an ocean liner with American passengers on board? Unquote. House responded, quote, I believe that a flame of indignation would sweep the United States and that by itself would be sufficient to carry us into the war." Unquote. Winston Churchill and Woodrow Wilson, in an operation financed by the Illuminati bankers, arranged for the shipment of weapons on the Lusitania in, Mar in May of 1915. The Lusitania luxury ocean liner was owned by the Cunard Steamship Line Shipping Company and officially part of the British Auxiliary Navy. The ship's owners were paid 218,000 British pounds a year to keep the Lusitania on the government payroll. As a pseudo-naval ship, the Lusitania was under orders from the British Admiralty to ram any German ships seeking to inspect her cargo. In 1915, it was against U.S. law to put weapons on a passenger ship traveling from the United States to England or Germany. Three German spies attempted to confirm that the 90 tons of unrefrigerated butter destined for a British naval base were weapons and ammunition. The spies were detained on the ship. The weapons loaded on the Lusitania were seen by the German dock workers and reported to the German embassy. In order to warn Americans about the weapons shipment and the perils of traveling on a military vessel, the Imperial German Embassy attempted to place an advertisement in 50 East Coast newspapers. The ads were printed with a date of April 22, 1915, but the United States State Department blocked all the ads except one. George Virek, the man who placed the ads for the embassy, protested to the State Department on April 26 that the ads were blocked. Virek met with Secretary of State William Jennings Bryan and produced copies of the Lusitania Supplementary Manifest. Bryan, impressed by the evidence that the Lusitanian had carried weapons, cleared publication of the warning. Someone higher than the Secretary of State, likely Colonel House and or President Wilson, overruled Brian. Never, nevertheless, one ad slipped past the State Department censorship and into the history books. The warning read, <clears throat> quote, Notice, Travelers intending to embark on the Atlantic voyage are reminded that a state of war exists between Germany and her allies and Great Britain and her allies that the zone of war includes the waters adjacent to the British Isles, that, 
in accordance with formal notice given by the Imperial German government, vessels flying the flag of Britain or any of her allies are liable to destruction in those waters, and that travelers sailing in the war zone on ships of Great Britain or her allies do so at their own risk. Imperial German Embassy, Washington, D.C., April 22, 1915. Unquote. Captain Dow, the Lusitania captain, immediately before Captain Turner, resigned on March 8, 1915, because he was no longer willing to carry the responsibility of mixing passengers with munitions or contraband. Captain Dow had a close call just two days earlier and was aware the rules of naval warfare changed in October 1914 when Churchill issued orders that those British merchant ships that carry munitions or contraband must ram U-boats. Prior to this change by Churchill, both England and Germany adhered to cruiser rules. Cruiser rules enabled crews and passengers to escape in lifeboats before being fired on. With the new Churchill Ram rules, the German U-boats could no, no longer surface to issue a warning and fired while submerged. Here, Churchill candidly states his goal of dragging the United States into the war. Quote, the first British countermove made on my responsibility was to deter the Germans from surface attack. The submerged U-boat had to rely increasingly on underwater attack and thus ran the greater risk of mistaking neutral for British ships and of drowning neutral crews and thus embroiling Germany with other great powers." Unquote. The above, combined with the next Churchill quote, speaks volumes about what really happened and why. Quote, there are many kinds of maneuvers in war. There are maneuvers in time, in diplomacy, in mechanics, in psychology, all of which are removed from the battlefield, but react often decisively up upon it. The maneuver which brings an ally into the field is as serviceable as that which wins a great battle." Unquote. On May 7, 1915, the Lusitania slowed to 75% speed, hoping the English escort vessel, the Juno, would arrive. Unknown to Captain Turner of the Lusitania, Winston Churchill had ordered the Juno to return to port. Churchill's order left the Lusitania alone and unprotected in a known area with German U-boats. To really slam the point home, England had broken the German Communications Code on December 14, 1914. The level of detail known by the British Admiralty was so precise that U-boat names and general locations were known and used against the doomed Lusitania and her passengers. The Lusitania was torpedoed on May 7, 1915, and 1,198 innocent souls were lost in order to bring the United States into war against Germany, all according to plan. The official German response was that the Lusitania was acting as a warship by transporting armaments that would be used to kill German soldiers, which is exactly true. This, of course, was vehemently denied by the State Department. The United States entered the war against Germany and the rest is history, as they say. One of the officers present in the command room in London while the plan for the Lusitania was being cooked up was Commander Joseph Kenworthy, who previously had been called upon by Churchill to submit a paper on what would be the political results of an ocean liner being sunk with American passengers aboard. He left the room in disgust as the plan was unf unfolding. In 1927, in his book, The Freedom of the Seas, he states, quote, The Lusitania was sent at considerably reduced speed into an area where a U-boat was known to be waiting and with her escorts withdrawn, unquote. For decades, the British and American governments had denied that there were weapons on the Lusitania. 
The site of the sinking was declared a protected site, denying divers access. To further frustrate the ability to, ter to determine what the Lusitania carried, the Royal Navy, beginning in 1946, repeatedly dropped depth charges on top of the Lusitania as a site for target practice. In 1968, to keep the truth secret, the British Secret Service unsuccessfully attempted to buy the salvage rights to the Lusitania. In 1993, PBS Online visited the wreck and found previous visitors had tampered with the evidence. While the British government's aggressively worked to distort the truth, weapons were confirmed in July 2006 when Victor Quirk of the Cork Sub Aqua Club found 15,000 rounds of 303 bullets in the bow section of the ship, confirming munitions were indeed being transported. In 1918, World War I ended and in 1919 came, came the Versailles Peace Conference near Paris. The elite of the Illuminati puppets from Britain and the United States, people like Alfred Milner, Edward Mandel House, and Bernard Baruch, were appointed to represent their countries at the meetings, which decided how the world would, would be changed as a result of the war these same people had created. They decided to impose impossible reparations payments on Germany, so ensuring the collapse of the post-war Weimar Republic amid unbearable economic conditions and thus create the very circumstances that enabled Hitler's rise to power. While humanity paid the ultimate price with at least 20 million killed, the war industry made a financial killing as did the Illuminati, who funded both sides again. No matter who would have won the First World War, the Illuminati would have won and we would have lost. In the aftermath of the bloody conflict of World War I, the League of Nations, the forerunner to the United Nations, was presented in Versailles as a resolution to the horrendous problems that the world had witnessed. The League of Nations' primary function was to keep peace in the world through ordered relationships among the member nations. The only problem with this is that too many nations saw its authority as dangerous to their own country's sovereignty, and rightly so, and refused to join. It was subsequently disbanded, and the great plan was dead in the water having failed to spark a one-world governmental body that would advance to total control over the world. The Illuminati and their minions immediately went back to work on bringing about the next global conflict, World War II. In the next chapter, you're going to see how the United States was again tricked into war using a false flag operation with the full knowledge and approval of alleged 33rd degree Freemason, President FDR. All right, that's the end of that chapter. It was, um, hopefully you may have learned something or at least uh, got some ideas to research and verify for yourself. And this goes back into our ingrained history that we've been taught or watch on the History Channel or whatever your source has been up to now. Schools uh, where it's basically the complete opposite of, not really the opposite, but how things work to get it, us into the wars. And um, I'm afraid to even try, you know, start talking about what's happening today. I mean, right now with ISIS and Syria and the, like, they're right now bombing ISIS, you know, with airstrikes. And the people that are defending uh, the United States' decision and the authority to do that is are just, they need to look into the real history of these wars and uh, false flag attacks. All right, so that's it for this one, and uh, we'll pick up again with World War II, so I'll talk to you then.